to push my paddock. And I'd probably go home, I just stayed there. I could dream of what I was doing. I could see this lovely thing coming up in front of me. Sometimes it was vague, sometimes it was quite clear cut, and other times it was vague. But to keep it, and it was something like this that say, for instance, if you, what it is, if you, have you ever tried to light a ma match or a little fire on a windy, damp day? Well, now, if you start to do it, first and foremost, you get the, the wind blows it out. But if you shelter it very carefully with your hand, you might get a little bit of a blaze. You put another stick on, another stick on. Always careful that you don't let the wind get too much at it. And then subsequently, you get such a blaze up that all the winds of the world won't blow it down. Well, that little dream that I had, or that little light that I had, that I could see, that is the thing that I had to keep alive, and a light. And you can see perfectly well that if I'd have gone in for a more democratic way of doing things, like uh, having committees, and like I'd built buildings in the past, having quantities of fares and engineers and everything, and having a conference, and the architect's always the boss, and he tells them what to do there. But the point of the thing is, I didn't want to do that. It was just, uh, the engineer would give me a bit of advice, and the other person would give me advice. But you still need a workforce. How did you then set about... Oh, well, you see, uh, see, it was a very funny thing, that too. Because my wife, she's a doctor. She was a... When we were in Europe, I wouldn't exhibit my pictures. My, oh, I wouldn't sell my pictures. I exhibited them, but I wouldn't sell them. And she said, we don't seem to be getting on too, too well at all from the monetary point of view. She said, so I'll just finish medicine and practice and I'll keep you in the state that you would like to be kept in. A grand state then? Oh, I always had rather, you know, grandiose ideas possibly. But the point of the thing is, she, she was very good to me and she was doing this. And I, I, at that particular time I thought I would, this is before I started down here, I'd go to, to Jaffa and paint pictures of of the, of the old, old parts of Jerusalem and all around there and send my pictures back to, 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 to England to be sold. But she said, what's the good of you sending? You never send them back, you won't sell them. So anyway, whether it will happen or not, she got dis disseminated sclerosis on their way out. And that's why I landed in Australia again. She got disseminated sclerosis. And so I came back where we could s settle down. And the funnel, funnily enough, see, she was, during that period, when she was so sick, you see that nude over there? Yes. And that one there. Now those, those two pictures, that one I painted in Paris, this one I painted there, she was blind and paralysed. A lot of people wouldn't think painting girls when they're blind and paralysed. And, uh, but, 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 but to me it was just an aesthetic experience. See this little thing, I wasn't wanting to make love with women at all. I just wanted to see these lovely visions come from out. Justice Jorgensen, did Montsalvet come as a grand concept or was it something that just grew? Oh, mostly as a, a grand concept. What was that original concept? Well, actually, when I was a young man, I decided I wouldn't uh, practice architecture as a profession. Got, I got sick of it. And that I'd develop as a portrait painter and a painter, but primarily I always thought of myself as a philosopher that sometimes painted uh, or, and did architecture rather than the reverse. Did you start off though with a, a vision of uh, buildings, a complex? Well a actually it came about in a rather simple sort of a way that uh, when I applied for a permit for my building, that's the first little one there, 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 there where Sig lives, um, when I applied for the permit, they came along and they said to me, well, it's not big enough, you haven't got enough squares. So I said, oh, I'll go home again and do another drawing. I went home and did this other drawing, which I've kept very, very rigorously to, to this great big building. I could see it sort of floating in front of me. And when I took it down to the council, they thought I'd go and bar me then. Anyway, the my, one of the president of the Shire, I knew him quite well because he used to try to teach me Latin and Greek when I was young. And 
He said, well, let him have a go. Anyway, they knew I was an architect and wouldn't build a thing, you know, badly, badly. Was it excitement over just the idea of this complex of buildings or was it a broader thing of artists oh, in a sort of working community? It was, no, I never really had any ideas of communities. I wasn't an individual that was the slightest interested in uh, artistic communities at all. I, I was worldly wise enough to know that it was almost an impossibility. Because, see, if you get... See, a community is a sort of a democratic thing in which people come together and they have meetings, and the tendency is for them to say, we. Well, now, that wasn't my type of business at all. I, I could never imagine to do that we could build anything. I could only imagine I could build something, or they could build something. So I said, if you want to build something, you know, there's plenty of land in Earth and buy some, and, but if you'd like to help me to build something, you can stay with me. And of course, the moment that you get sick of me, you can go, and then if you've found some other better thing to do, you can do it, and then if you want to come back again, you can always come back. How did you actually get started, though? It's all very well to uh, have a, a vision, if you like. It's just, just very difficult to <laughs> think of that, because in, in a sense, I bought this... Well, my wife bought me this paddock here, this one there. And uh, so I thought to myself, well, I, I'll have to start digging into the hillside. I had a lot of energy and I dig into the hillside to you know, get other people to do it, so to get the material with which to build it. So, I, see, it's a very uh, plastic sort of material, beautiful material to build with, and uh, see, so you knock a hole out here, put a lump there, and do things like that. And then you go round to the wreckage yards, which were plenty of them about because there's, there was no building going on at that time because it was the late 20, you know, 30. When you um, told friends, uh, artist friends, of the vision, or if you like, that mm. you'd had up here, what, what was the res response? They think it was a crazy scheme? Or? Oh, well, seeing I was an architect, I suppose they thought I knew how to build things, but I know Billy McGuinness and these people are ringing up and imploring me, why not to let me go on with it? He said, because he'll, he'll come down the shower of mud. You see, because earth buildings are very, very good buildings, but people f have a very funny idea about them. But anyway, I, I started on building that place over there. And what then, what course, place is that? That's the one with Siggy's. And then I started on, on this bigger complex here. But um, to get to the stage where you had a, a veritable dedicated band of followers who were yeah. prepared to come out, how, how did you organise people, manipulate them perhaps to, well, to, well, to, well, to do that? Well, strangely enough, it wasn't very difficult because I used to have a, I seemed to have a knack at that particular time. And if I got into a... In, came up here and I was standing round or sitting down on the grass, I'd have all these people come up to, to speak to me. So I had to have some of my staff saying, you can't speak to him, he, he, he won't be spoken to. You'll only come, you'll come to dinner around about when the bell rings and you have dinner and then we'll speak, but he, you can't stop speaking to him now. Well, now, all these people became, well, you know really what it is, it's sort, of, sort of a thing catches on, completely catches on. They think, they used to think themselves a queer sort of an individual. Who's he to put on airs and graces that he's like a king and will only be spoken to when he, when he wants to? And that all these arguments were going round and round. What an arrogant individual I was. And uh, it's harder to meet me than to meet the Governor General and all these things, well, it was all sort of... It was, in a sense, true, because I was completely unambitious. But what fired something. the young people who were prepared to come up and give so much of their well, time? I'll give you a bit of good advice. Now, you go along and you go out with some pretty girls. You go out into the country and you sit there day after day just looking at the beautiful scenery, just looking at them, doing this, and not trying to make the slightest effect with them, making no passes at them. Before long, they feel your very sort of objectivity makes them feel crisis, am I bad as that? And they try then to, to, to see what you're like. And they get focused onto you a bit. And then another person comes on. That adds up and adds up and adds up, till eventually you've got quite a big 
labour force. It sounds like you're a pretty calculating sort of person. You, you I wasn't were... really calculating <laughs> really much at all. I don't think I calculated. See, a lot of people would think that, very, very calculating, to think that when I'd be painting a picture or painting a, a nude, see, I'd be or doing drawings. I'd do drawings, and the way an, arch, uh, an artist draws, the uh, way I do anyway, you get a... The model lies down on, a, on the ground, or model thrown, and you go around and you do sketches, 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 and you drop your sketches all around as you go along, you see. And uh, after you've done a whole lot of them, the model has a rest. And she gets up, and the tendency is for her then to, to want to look at what I've done. Well, the tendency is I always find myself as jostling her out of position, you see, so that I could see, me, see them myself. And instead of giving her a kiss or something like that, I'd say, oh, I'll start, I'll start drawing again now. And sometimes they'd burst into tears of frustration and irritation. Well, then they'd, they'd report this to one person, then to another person. And before long, you'd imagine I was Rudolph Valentino, with a little hitter eye. It would seem that you, there was a, something of a who's who of the early Melbourne art movement coming and going to and from the hills. Mm. And many of these people you've apparently painted. Could we have a look at some of the people yeah. that were associated with the, the, the early work up mm. here at Montsville? Well, I'll tell you a very funny thing about the who's who business. I got letters from who's who asking for bi biographical notes and uh, what I'd done and what I hadn't done. So I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be determined by people like this. I'm not going to depend on them. So I chucked them into the fire. So that's why I suppose I'm not in who's who. I don't know whether I am or not. Well, many of your friends are and, and, yeah. and will continue to be. Anyway, let's have a look at some of the paintings. Well, you, now, you, see, you can see perfectly well. This is the reason why I more or less leave this one out. Yes, well, well, what did you have in mind when you developed that? It's a very sensuous painting. Yes, well, the thing is, it's supposed to be the sculptor. He's supposed to be a sculptor. And he'd been wrestling all night with this problem of being able to carve out of the block of stone the image that he saw within it. And as he gets the early morning comes on, he's probably a bit groggy, it seems to turn to life in his arms. And with the pale pink skies of the morning, as you see there, the, the, the body seems to, to become pink too. Now there's one version that I did of it in which the the body's all marble and cold. But I thought to myself, no, I didn't like that idea so much. It looked too much like six in the head, a la Freud. So I got it back to this one. When was that painted? Oh, a few years ago, and there's another one over there, and I've done several of them. Many people would be outraged by a painting like that. Do you, do you mm. ever consider that the, the sort of attitudes of the community? Never enters into my head. <laughs> Here on your right, the there's a... thing that enters into my head is teaching children how to bane people. That's the uh, thing that irritates me. There's a row of portraits on your right there. Mm. Uh, are those people, uh, were they associated with the early Monsalvet? All of them, most of them were, yes. Well, you see, there's a fella called Brearley. There was my manager. Sorry, Minogue. who were they? That's a fella called Brearley. There's a fella called Minogue. There's a fella called Bill Cook. There's a fellow called Professor Taylor. There's another soldier fellow, another fellow, another Professor Taylor. Did all these people come up here and help in one way? Yes, or they all helped me. Yeah, they all came and helped me. Can we walk around the, the gallery and have a look mm. at some of the other pieces? You were an associate of Meldrum's. I, I used to teach for Meldrum. I was his pupil at one time. But he, uh, he was a remarkable man. I, admired him tremendously, still do. That, there's, a, there's a portrait down there on the, the lower floor of a lady, that's very much that's, in the Meldrum style. That's my wife. When was that actually painted? That was painted in Paris about a good while ago. Were we, you very much under Meldrum's influence in those early days? Very much under his influence, yes. Then over on the right is the portrait again of your wife that you'd referred to earlier. Uh, then on the other wall, another nude study. Is that also your wife there? That, that one's my wife, yes, that one there. Of the, uh, she was blind and paralysed when I painted that. Now that one there, the, the top one,
That was painted in Paris. He wasn't blind then. That was in the Royal Academy, that picture. Then from that there. realistic style to this one down here on the floor, it's almost like the French Impressionist. How, how well, much after? Well, in, in a sort of a sense, I took, for a while I took very much of an... I used to know these fellows in Paris, like Matisse and these people, and I, I used to like uh, positioning pictures, like uh, take those little nice little French art books I'd put them in certain positions. And in a sort of a sense, you, if you put it there, or you put it there, or put it there, it, it, you could even give yourself the positioning of the thing, make you get to almost the toothache, it looked so terrible. And then the colours, change the colour, change this, change that. You apparently have never been overly fond of exhibiting. Why is that? Oh, well, the th point of the thing is I, Never f felt any much interest in it. The um, I couldn't see that that uh, the people that would be looking at my pictures knew anything about it. They didn't. But I, I got on very well with them in a way. The one one of the fellows put me in a in a uh, a book of still life painting right through the whole history of still life painting. And I was in this book, it's over there somewhere. And, um, and he was one of the reasons what made me give up uh, doing these things a bit, 